have this PowerPoint, please feel free to pop questions in the chat and we can, and we can um, as I'm going, and we can talk about them later on. Um, and I also put the entire text in this PowerPoint um, in lieu of captioning just um, so that you can follow along as well. And I hope I don't go too fast. Um, all right. So this is a chapter of my dissertation. And this chapter particularly deals with reading and writing as a type of um, political action. So here's just a quick outline. Um, I'm going to start with my dissertation's overarching claim um, that has to do with something called the historical a priori. And then I'm going to talk about writing, reading, and self-reflection as inventive, um, as something having to do with questioning and reflection. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about political action, and I'll summarize my main points in my concluding remarks. And you can all hear me okay, right? Great. Yep. Okay. So let me just minimize this here. My dissertation looks at European colonialism's role in self and world constitution, intersubjectivity, self-awareness, and temporality. Colonialism's role in subjectivity is not merely the content of a bare, empty structure of human subjectivity. Colonialism is a structure that determines the way we see ourselves and interact with others and the world around us today. And so I take a philosophical approach called phenomenology, and that's how I'll be discussing European colonialism and Franz Fanon here. Uh, and please note, I will be discussing a little bit of anti-Black racism and colonial violence. So to develop this claim, I delve into the multidisciplinary disciplinary work of Franz Fanon. Fanon's work, such as Black Skin, White Masks, and Wretched of the Earth, presents critiques to phenomenology and psychiatry by showing the inherent coloniality and racialization in concepts and practices that appear to be timeless, raceless, universal, and humanist. For Fanon, subjectivity is not only structured by each individual's particular experience and circumstances, but by historical determinations of racialized identity that are imposed by and reproduced through institutions and by individuals. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means in a second. So the historical a priori, a priori is a phenomenological concept that, um, that began with um, a phenomenologist named Husserl and also Michel Foucault talks a little bit about the historical a priori, but here I'm gonna talk about it in the way that I see how Fanon talks about it. So one of the main claims in my dissertation is that European colonialism was a contingent event that once instituted became a structure of the self and world constitution. In other words, colonialism has a historical a priori structure. So for phenomenologists like Husserl and Merleau-Ponty, the historical a priori means that world constitution is shaped by origins that determine our scope of knowledge, possibility, and conceivability. These origins fade into the background as they are sedimented into our consciousness, and the scope of knowledge, possibility, and conceivability become naturalized as we forget those origins. And so for Husserl, scientific accomplishments since Galileo shape our world and determine what is knowable, possible, and conceivable. They also shape meaning and determine what we value as important, not only in fields of scientific and natural inquiry, but in how we see ourselves, others, and the world. My claim, drawing, on, drawing primarily on Fanon, is that colonialism has the structure of the historical a priori. As others have argued, the beliefs, justifications, and signs of colonialism and racialization were driven by the interests and commitments of individuals who had something to gain from the violence and oppression of colonialism. As those interests and commitments were concealed, the beliefs, justifications, and knowledge instituted by colonialism became naturalized. In other words, what appears to us to be the natural way of the world, such as biological race or our perception of linear, linear temporality, for example, is not natural at all. It was instituted through people, institutions, and other social, economic, and cultural conditions established through colonialism's expansion and complete domination. The historical roots of colonialism are then concealed so that these ways of experiencing the world seem natural. So why this matters? For Fanon, 
these colonial structures are naturalized um, in psychiatric, political, phenomenological, and philosophical methods and bodies of knowledge and in our perception of ourselves in the world around us. In other words, colonialism is at the root of the way we see ourselves, others, and the world. And together with racialization, colonialism is ingrained even in philosophical thought. So it's as if we're looking at the world through a lens that we never realized was there. The problem is, is we cannot remove this lens or perhaps it will take a very long time and a lot of work to do so. Um, so first we must recognize that we're wearing this lens in the first place. So the historical a priori is basically saying that we're looking through the world through this lens and we see things that appear natural to us, but we don't know that we are actually looking through this lens of colonialism. Um, the problem is we can't, we can't remove it or it'll take a long time. So the first step is we need to figure out that we're wearing the lens in the first place. And so to do anti-colonial and anti-racist work, we must uncover the hidden structures of colonialism that shape the ways we see ourselves, others, and the world. And for Fanon and others, this requires phenomenological description. That's the method that we use in phenomenology or first person description of our experience. This description must bracket or set aside the naturalized way of seeing the world in order to uncover colonialism's hold on our consciousness. This process is what Fanon calls disalienation. So I'm gonna talk about one way um, that we, one, practice of disalienation that Fanon talks about in Black Skin, White Mask. It's writing, um, writing and reading basically as self-reflection. So for Fanon to uncover the roots of colonialism in our experience, we must practice self-reflection through writing and reading. Reading and writing as practices of anti-colonial and anti-racist disalienation will look different for different people under colonialism, a difference that falls along racialized lines. In other words, your identity as it is determined by colonialism will matter in what you take away from reading. I will discuss three aspects of writing and reading as a disalienating practice, invention and transformation, questioning and reflection. So first, invention and transformation. The act of reading is an inventive practice that changes us as we read and allows us to recognize each other's freedom. Although it seems like reading is a passive act where we merely absorb what we are reading, phenomenolog phenomenologists discuss reading as an act where we are also inventing ourselves anew as we read. David Marriott claims that reading is not just an act of deciphering. Reading is inventive in that Fanon's readers will see themselves reflected in the book and will be changed by that reflection. Um, and I'll say here that Fanon says in Black Skin, White Masks, he says, this book is a mirror. So for Marriott, one becomes open to possibilities outside of prescribed universal truths. This transforms the reader as the reader begins to see into how they themselves sustain what appears to be true, but that cannot finally be true. The possibilities outside of the prescribed univer universal naturalized truths are in excess of meeting meaning that the reader creates while reading. In other words, reading allows us to see that there is something outside of what we understand to be natural and universal. Reading allows us to see that there are possibilities outside of the norm, even possibilities of living in a just world. And the type of reading, the way that I describe it here, it almost sounds like, okay, when we read something like, um, science fiction or speculative fiction, we kind of can start to imagine a new world or something like that. But I think that this also applies to reading philosophy, especially philosophy that is written by black indigenous and people of color. So I'm also, and, and also fiction at the same time. Um, some philosophers who I'm drawing on such as Maria Lugones, she talks about reading Invisible Man, for example, or reading Black Skin, White Masks. And I think that reading science fiction, which is something that we've been doing um, back on my campus or back at my school, uh, is another way, I think, to, to imagine something outside of um, 
our world. And so to deepen Marriott's account, we can turn to Sartre's What is Literature essay. So Sartre says that reading is a creative act because the literary object is given through language, not in language. The meaning found through reading is not in the words on the page, nor is the meaning explicitly given by the author. So we don't find meaning just by looking at text. The meaning is found through through the meaning found through reading is created by the reader in what, what Sartre says is in a continual exceeding of the written thing, which is kind of a funny way of saying anything really, but it's Sartre, um, a silence that exceeds the words on the page. So the literary object, the silence created by the reader is the meaning of the text for the reader. So what Sartre is saying here is, it isn't like the, the little black marks on the page. That, like, that's not where we get meaning. We get meaning when we imagine what is happening and that happens between words. And this act of creation is also an act of freedom. Opening a book is to assume responsibility for it. Thus for Satra, the author, and, the author and reader recognize each other's freedom in a pact of generosity in which the author and reader must trust each other, count on each other and demand from each other what they demand for themselves. So in a way, when we read Fanon's Black Skin, White Masks, it's a pact that we are making with Fanon. In his work, we read about Fanon's distressing and desalinating experience of being a black man in white French society. We read his joy, his pain, his doubt, and his rage. We also read his anti-colonial and anti-racist dedication to the creation of a new world. As he demands this of himself, he also demands this of us. So reading him must also be our promise to engage in anti-racist and anti-colonial action. If we were to read Black Skin, White Masks and really listen to what Fanon is saying, what he's saying about philosophy, but also what he's saying about our world, if we were to believe him, that must mean that we are also engaging in anti-racist and anti-colonial action. So in a way, we're not just reading passively and absorbing what Fanon is saying. In a way, we're also creating this promise. We're also changing the way that we see the world through reading. So questioning, this is another one that I think us as philosophers will really, really like lash on to really well. So Fanon says that transformation takes place in something called the zone of hidden fluctuation. Um, for there to be transformation, the writer must encourage questioning. Fanon says, quote, it is not enough to try and disengage ourselves by accumulating proclamations and denials. It is not enough to reunite with the people in a past where they no longer exist. We must rather reunite with them in their recent counter move, which will suddenly call everything into question. We must focus on that zone of hidden fluctuation where the people can be found for let there be no mistake it is here that their souls are crystallized and their perception and respiration transfigured. And so the zone of hidden fluctuation for Fanon is our penchant for questioning and doubt. The zone outside of the prescribed universal truths as Marat suggests and the fluctuating nausea of being faced with making our own judgments. This is where transformation of our pre-reflective self-consciousness takes place. So pre-reflective self-consciousness, that's just another word of saying sort of that lens that I was talking about. Fanon closes black skin, white masks with his final prayer. Oh, my body always make me a man who questions. The zone of hidden fluctuation is the zone of freedom. To always be a man who questions is to always be free. Fanon points out that to reach people, to appeal to their freedom, we must focus on their penchant for questioning coloniality rather than feeding people proclamations of what they believe. And coloniality is what separates Fanon's account from other accounts such as Satra's because the penchant for questioning for the colonized person is rooted in questioning the colonial structure of subjectivity. This type of questioning is not open-ended. It is the questioning of, the colon of coloniality and colonialism's prescribed universal truths. In other words, when we do our philosophical questioning, which is what they teach us from day one, from 
from philosophy 101, they teach us about Descartes and doubt and, and asking questions, asking a particular kind of philosophical question. That's what we do, right? For Fanon, in order to make that an anti-racist um, type of questioning, we have to look at that lens, that colonialism's lens that we're wearing. It requires us to see, okay, how is what I'm studying in philosophy even, how's what I'm studying affected by coloniality? How's it affected by race? Like, what are the foundations of this thing that I'm looking at? And how does colonialism structure those foundations? And I think that it's really good to think about it this way because we already have an idea of what we do in philosophy when we look at foundations, um, when we question the foundations, when we try to think, okay, what assumptions are being made when it comes to this type of philosophical thought? And what, I, what Fanon is asking is you have to add a little bit to that. We're not only generally looking for open-ended assumptions, we're looking for the assumptions of col that colonialism brings in, that race brings in. And so finally, reflection. Different readers will have different demands under colonization. And this different fall, this, these differences fall along racialized lines. So Fanon's writing in Black Skin, White Masks indeed demands from the Black colonized reader what Fanon demands of himself, decolonial reflectiveness or critical self-reflection upon the colonial structure of experience. The pact of generosity between Fanon and Fanon's Black reader is a recognition of one's own and each other's freedom. As Fanon says in the conclusion, here's my freedom which sends me back, back to me my own reflection. Fanon's writing shows the colonized reader that his experience mirrors the reader's own experience and that the reader can also critically self-reflect. Fanon doesn't present the reader, the, the Black or person of color reader with a universal truth of colonization and what it means for black colonized people, but presents particular cases and describes his own experience while emphasizing the particularity of those experiences. So when Fanon describes his own experience, he's not saying that, oh, all black people in Algeria, which is where he was writing at the time, all black colonized people feel this way. He's just saying, no, this is my experience and you can also reflect on your experience. Rather than forcing facts upon an audience, Fanon recognizes the black colonized reader's freedom and trusts the reader to make his own conclusions. And although the white reader is also alienated under colonialism, so the, in other words, the white reader is also wearing those lens, that lens of colonialism, they will read this book differently. Their reflection in the mirror will not reflect Fanon's experience back to them. White readers are not supposed to imagine themselves in a black person's shoes, nor is Fanon's description intended to be a plea for white sympathy. Rather, whiteness must be reflected back to them. They must recognize the colonizer or oppressor in themselves. And I think that this part is, is, the, is a hard part because when we read a book, a book like Black Skin, White Masks, when we read a book like, like The Invisible Man, many people my, and myself included as a non-black person of color we are trying to understand what it's like to be a black person in in society and i think that what fanon and also what satra and also what maria Lugones says about reflection about a book being like a mirror is that when we read those works we need to see as white people need to see how whiteness is reflected back at them. So how whiteness in books like Invisible Man, like that is who is, should be reflected to the white reader. In fact, those are the structures that white people today are still benefiting from. That is what, that's the difference in how a white reader and a black reader will read the same text. And I think, that Fanon and others say this because in a way we will never, those of us who are not black, will never fully understand that experience. Um, we should, it's our responsibility to listen and to read that experience. 
But what it means for us is we have to look at ourselves and see how have I been complicit in this system, in the racism that Fanon or that, um, that Elson is talking about in a book like that. And finally, political action. Um, Fanon, let me think. So Fanon, I'm gonna introduce this here and Fanon talks about it, um, but I go further into political action in another chapter. So I'm only gonna talk about this kind of briefly. So for Fanon, reading and writing, though necessary, must lead to political action. For Fanon, this means taking up arms in the national struggle against French colonial occupation and rebuilding Algerian society. That's Fanon's specific context. Although Fanon performs the salienating practice in writing black skin, white masks, he performs a meta-analysis in the process of writing in Wretched of the Earths on national, national culture. Writing, visual art, and poetry are important for colonized people to first realize our alienation, so to first realize that we're wearing that lens. But the colonized creator shouldn't stop there. The creator must also take part in other kinds of direct political action. And just as a correction, um, I wrote here writing and reading and writing though necessary must lead to political action. What I actually mean is reading and writing must necessarily lead to political action. They're not necessary for political action. I hope that distinction is clear. Fanon illustrates this point by discussing the story of poet Keith Fodeba. Fodeba's long poem, Africa Dawn, describes an indigenous man chosen to leave his village at the request of a white district guard. Despite being a hero of, of the battlefields of Europe, he is gunned down by police upon his return home. Sounds familiar, right? Fanon says that any colonized person who has served for France or Britain will recognize themselves in this poem. Recognizing oneself in the poem is an intellectual and political act that not only identifies the colonized person's political role, but prepare, prepares him or her to fight against colonialism. Fanon goes on to explain that Fadeba's revolutionary action did not end there. Fadeba went on to work with the Republic of Guinea to derail plots organized by French colonialism to bring down the newly independent Guinea. Fadeba was not only a poet, he was politically involved as well. Fanon concludes, quote, when the colonized intellectual writing for his people uses the past, he must do so with the intention of opening up the future, of spurring them into action and fostering hope. But in order to secure hope, in order to give it substance, he must take part in the action and commit himself, body and soul, to the national struggle. You can talk about anything you like, but when it comes to talking about that one thing in a man's life that involves opening up new horizons, enlightening your country, and standing tall alongside your own people, then muscle power is required. This passage helps paint a picture of what Fanon means when he speaks of future all creation, invention, working out new concepts, and setting afoot a new man. Opening up new horizons requires, requires muscle power. Speech, poetry, visual art, and writing may lead individuals to realize their own alienation, but to create a new future requires material political action. And just to go back to this quote a little bit, basically Fanon is saying that it's an important first step to do self-reflection through writing and reading. It's a really important first step. But as this poet did, it needs to also lead to taking part in political action. And in this case, it meant for Fodeba, um, he worked for the newly, the newly independent Guinea. So, just to explain this historically a little bit. So Fanon is, is from Martinique, but he was writing, he, he worked for a psychiatric hospital and he was part of the Algerian War of Independence. And basically Algeria was under French colonial rule. So in order to decolonize Algeria, um, the FLN, the, the, the national, um, well, I can't remember <laughs> what it stands for, but, but the opposing force in Algeria had to take up arms. They also had to create a new social structure and community for 
the Algerian people. And that required um, rebuilding society in many ways. And it also required them to take up arms against the French. And so finally at the end of the War of Algeria, um, Algeria became an independent country and something similar happened in Guinea as well. So this poet didn't only write poetry, is really super important to write poetry, but this poet also took part in this whole political um, and social revolution that was happening. So for, for us, I think that means that when we're doing writing and reading, especially for us doing philosophy, it's not only important for us to do philosophy. We must also make it into, we must also turn it into material political action. And those two things need to be done alongside each other. So just a few concluding remarks. I hope I didn't go too fast, but I am happy to take questions. So um, just a summary, European colonialism structures self, other and world constitution. So European colonialism is a historical a priori structure in that it was a contingent event that became hidden, naturalized and sedimented into our consciousness. And that's really the, the historical a priori, that's, that's really the pheno technical phenomenological part of my dissertation. So our first step in anti-colonial and anti-racist action is uncovering the hidden roots of colonialism and making explicit the ways that they shape our experience. And for Phnom, this is called desalination. Reading and writing are practices of desalination that will help us uncover the lens of colonialism and also transform that lens. Reading and writing are not enough. They're a good starting place, but must be accompanied with political action. And I didn't talk about writing that much actually, now that I'm re reflecting back on it, but I can talk about writing a little bit as well. I guess by writing here, I mean, um, Fanon describes his experience by writing his book. And of course we write philosophy as well. Reading and writing, finally, reading and writing are not necessary for resistance as many people who cannot read and write engage in resistant and revolutionary acts every day and have throughout history. So looking forward to address colonialism's hold on ourselves in the world, we must practice anti-racist and anti-colonial self-awareness and use critical reflection to inform our political action in our own communities. And just to add here, I think that philosophy, I mean, I'm biased because I'm a philosopher, but I think philosophy is an incredibly important tool to help us do this. I don't think it's a necessary tool, but I think us as philosophers have this really incredible tool to help us with self-awareness and, and critical reflection, especially if we consider how that lens of colonialism affects the way that we do philosophy. And so the questions and issues I touch on are deeply philosophical, but also extend beyond philosophy. These questions and issues center the experiences of, of people, of marginalized people, but concern all of us. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was an excellent presentation, uh, very enlightening. So now we are gonna begin the question and answer period. So uh, you're welcome to raise your hand and ask a question over the microphone, um, but you can also ask questions in the chat and I will repeat them and to Rebecca. Uh, 